Excellent. I hope that's okay, Johnny, for record. Absolutely. Kind of taking on the role, which is not mine here. I think uh, uh, Jingyu and Jen Dong are going to chair the meeting. And, yes, um, and I don't know if Adrian is here. <coughs> Yeah, Adrian is here too. And we're right on time. I should shut up. <laughs> okay. So, hi, everybody. I hope you are all doing great. Um, welcome to the second wish of the semester. Today, we are delighted to have with us John McLennan mm -hmm. from the University of Utah. John will talk about the third EGS project for which he's co-PI with John Moore that we've already had over the summer for fish. If you missed it, the talk is available on YRL YouTube channel. John got his PhD in civil engineering from the University of Toronto in 1980 and has more than 35 years of, of experience with petroleum service and technology companies. Since 2009, he has been a faculty member in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Utah. So thanks again, John, for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Uh, Yu, thank you so much. And, and thanks everyone for this invitation. Um, and I, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about FORGE. And I'll, I'll specifically talk about hydraulic fracturing and FORGE is a Department of Energy venture. It stands for Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. And as I indicated, DOE is sponsoring this, but we've been lucky enough to have many stakeholders, local, statewide, and uh, uh, certainly our congressional representation as well, to whom we're very, very grateful. Now, what is all this about? Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. Well, as, as Ching Yu mentioned, my colleague Joe Moore gave you some basic introduction about the Forge site. So I've tried to put together a talk that's, that's um, going to follow on from what Joe likely talked to you about. And what he, what he probably first did was introduce the difference between enhanced geothermal systems and conventional geothermal systems. Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Conventional geothermal systems have three attributes, and those are temperature, at a, a adequate temperature at a depth that you can drill to, um, uh, fractures within the reservoir, and fluid, in situ fluid that can be movable uh, within that fracture system so that you have a convectively dominated fracture system where you can produce fluid to the surface, convert that to electricity or, or potentially direct heat, um, and then re-inject that fluid. Well, in most parts of the country, um, as, as we know, particularly uh, um, away from uh, tectonic hotspots, um, we don't have all of those elements. We can drill deep enough to uh, reach high enough temperatures, but there's, there's no fr not necessarily adequate fracturing and there's not necessarily in situ fluid. So what if we took the opportunity to uh, introduce natural, introduce fractures and add fluid so that we had all three components. And in fact, this is the concept of enhanced geothermal systems where you have two wells that are interconnected by hydraulic fracturing and you can circulate fluid through this hydraulic fracture network and it acts as a heat exchanger. So it's, it's a pretty simple idea. And you can see, however, that we've been trying to do this for 50 years since the work at Fenton Hill in the Jemez Caldera, just outside of Los Alamos, New Mexico. And, you know, frankly, none of these have been tremendously successful commercially. I think Solz is maybe generating a megawatt of electricity, um, a megawatt of uh, electrical energy. Um, and Cooper Basin in Australia uh, was a scientific success, but a commercial um, not successful commercially. Raft River, there's been some success there. It's, a, it's more like a hybrid EGS situation and, and we, won't, we won't talk about these other things. But DOE recognized the opportunity for enhanced geothermal systems. And they also recognize the difficulties that we've experienced over the last 50 years 
So they initiated the Forge project, which uh, has been going on for the last, you know, five, six years. And a number of sites were considered, but ultimately a site in central Utah was selected because it had the attributes that are appropriate for an enhanced geothermal system. And those include adequate temperature, 350 Fahrenheit, we're, we're, we're actually closer to 430, 440 degrees Fahrenheit at the depths that we're at. And those are depths that are within uh, relatively easy drilling depths. Um, it's a situation where you're dealing with impermeable rocks. And, and, the, and the reason for that is that you're looking for a system that has conductive heat transfer rather than convective heat transfer, as would occur through the natural fracture systems in a conventional hydrothermal geothermal system. You're also looking for a, a situation that, that people at, at, at your facility can uh, dramatically appreciate, and that's a situation where there is relatively low risk of induced seism seismicity. And, and this area has been monitored by the University of Utah seismograph station since the, uh, since the early 80s, and it's relatively benign, and the potential is low for significant uh, seismicity associated with, with the EGS operations. Low environmental risks, this, this is, is really in, in, in a desert area, very little wildlife, uh, no, no agricultural activity uh, other than some pig farming, but that, that, that happens in barns rather than on, on, the, um, uh, on the landscape. And um, no potable water, that's, that, that's really relevant here. And then as, as we mentioned that there's no interaction with a conventional hydrothermal system. So the Forge site was selected and the obligations and the conceptual agenda at Forge are to create an in-situ geothermal laboratory. And this has happened as shown in the schematic um, by um, creating a heat exchange system. And uh, so the first, first obligation is to drill this blue well. And that well has been drilled. That well has a, a total um, depth of just under 11,000 feet measured depth. And it's about 80, just about 8,500 odd feet true vertical depth. It's drilled at a 65 degree angle in the direction of the minimum principal stress. And the second step in this operation is to create a network of hydraulic fractures right at the end of this well, right at the toe of this well. And you can see it's, it's right in, in, the, in the toe of, of the first well. And grow those hydraulic fractures upwards and then subsequently drill a second well to intersect that fracture system so that now you've created a small heat exchange system, but notice that you've left most of the lateral section of these wells open for further research. And, and that's, that's part of the obligation of the FORGE project is to make the, this section, these sections of the wells available for research by, uh, through FOAs uh, and issue, issue uh, 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 awards to look at stimulation, perforating, logging, numerical calculations, uh, back analysis, uh, development of, of, of uh, isolation systems, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so that's, that's the concept of forge. In a commercial situation, you'd have more than those three fractures that I've shown that ideally you'd have fractures all along the length of that lateral section. And um, you'd be circulating cold water down wet, the blue well it would pass through the hydraulic fractures and be produced out through the red well. And at the surface, you would either flash it to steam or run it through an organic Rankine cycle binary plant, both ways creating electricity. Well, one of the questions that you may ask is, is you know, why did you not drill both of these wells at the same time? And uh, the, the answer to that question is historical. And it's things that we've learned from past experience. And, and, and actually one of the best demonstrations of this is the stimulation that was done on um, a couple of wells at, at Los Alamos at Fenton Hill in the Jemez in the, in the early 1980s and, and, and later on in the 1980s as well. And there were two wells that were drilled. There was well EE2 and there was well EE3. 
And these walls were sub-vertical. You can see that this is approximately the scale. There may be 30 degrees. I, I can't exactly remember what. But the stimulation was to go from, was to stimulate one well, grow that fracture to the second well, and develop a connection. And significant stimulation was carried out um, on EE2. But Unfortunately, this is this is what occurred, and 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 you have people on staff that are more expert th than than I am at this. But you can see the production well. This is a, a plan view, and you can see that these wells had slight angles. Um, the injection well and the production well, and you can see that most of the microseismic activity was distal from the production well, so there wasn't an adequate communication. So one of the lessons learned from Los Alamos is to drill the first well, do some sort of a stimulation, monitor the microseismicity, use whatever technologies are available um, to characterize the cloud of evolving hydraulic fractures, and then drill a second well to intersect that cloud. And um, hopefully there will be a, an effective intersection between the fractures that are created. And we'll talk quite a bit more about that as we proceed through this talk. So where are we now? We have drilled that first well, okay? That first well is known as 16A7832, and often we'll just call it 16A. And you can see that that well has been drilled. Here's a view, an aerial view looking to the west. This well started where my cursor is, and it was drilled down at a 65 degree angle at an azimuth of 105 degrees, which is pretty normal to what we think is the direction of the maximum horizontal principal stress. And so by virtue of that, you have the potential, seeing as the minimum stress is along the length of the well, the potential to create a multiplicity of fractures, ultimately communicating to a second well drilled immediately above that. The other wells that are of interest are 5632, and a well that, I ha that has been drilled that I, I need to update this slide, drilled right where my cursor is. And this original well, 5832, those three are all vertical wells varying in depth from 7,500 feet to 9,500 feet, as I recall. And there will be seismic monitoring equipment installed in those wells prior to the stimulation, along with the surface network of, uh, um, of, of, of geophones and, and, and other instrumentation so that we can do our best to triangulate on the chronological development of microseismic events and, and, and pick where the fractures are growing. So we've drilled that well, and just, I'm not gonna talk much about that well, but just some of the highlights and really the success stories. And it's not just hydraulic fracturing, it's drilling and reservoir characterization that have been very, very effective on, on this well. You know, prior to drilling this well, the geothermal community largely used roller cone bits those are the bits that you see uh, on television from oil well drilling in the 19, up through the, the, you know, the early 1990s even. These days, people are using polycrystalline diamond bits, but the geothermal business had not frankly changed. It was still using roller cone bits. They were getting rates of about eight to 10 feet per hour, and bits were maybe lasting for 40 hours. We said on this well, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna drill with polycrystalline diamond compact bits, which are um, bits that have uh, cutters with um, industrial diamonds brazed onto these tungsten carbide cutters. And uh, they've been used in the oil industry for the past 30 odd years plus. I mean, they, keep, they started in the seventies, but almost exclusively these days, the oil industry is using that type of bit. And ultimately, by the time we had finished this well, um, with, with many, many developments, we were up to drilling 50 or 60 feet per hour and bits lasting for seven or 800 feet. Subsequent wells that have been drilled were now drilling up on the order of 100 feet per hour and, and there was a bit run lasting 2000 feet. And so this, is, this dramatically changes the game in terms of drilling because drilling has historically been a huge cost that, that is potentially involved in creating a geothermal, uh, uh, commercial geothermal plant. And so now drilling costs have been reduced, um, costs for casing and other ancillary equipment and, and, and casing design are, are becoming more uh, dominant in the cost structure as, as this goes on. But nevertheless, drilling has been an important element. Also from the perspective, an engineering perspective, 
um, not, not only was the drilling improved by the bit design, but it was improved by actually using the bit as a laboratory and careful monitoring of what goes on at the bit. Um, in particular, what I'm just showing here and just illustrating are calculations of mechanical specific energy, MSE. And so MSE has been uh, enfranchised by the oil and gas industry since about 2005. And it, it really started to become involved in the geothermal industry with some of this recent drilling, where you're looking at an expenditure of energy. Each one of these terms is energy normalized per unit volume drilled. And that gives you units of PSI if, 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 or megapascals or pascals if, if you go through the calculations. And you can see there's a term here where this is the axial energy expended. WOB stands for weight on bit. So that's the force that is applied to the face of the hole. So it's, it's an axial term. And then you've also got TOR, oh, that's torque, and RPM, revolutions per minute. So this is a rotational energy expenditure normalized per unit volume drill. And if you minimize this term and watch this term, um, it, it really helps you with um, understanding, optimizing your drilling parameters and, and, and really has led to improvements in drilling. So, you know, a couple of messages from this talk is that even already, I think Forge has contributed substantially to improvements in drilling. We've had some nice um, reservoir characterization developments. Um, we, we have run uh, surface reflection seismic. Uh, uh, the resolution of that seismic has, has been difficult, largely because there's about 3,000 feet of granitic uh, of, of alluvium derived from the mountains to the east. Um, and uh, below that are granitoid bodies that have relatively high impedance. And so difficult, what surface seismic has identified is this contact rather than, the, than significant details within the granitoid. However, while we are drilling this well and other wells, we've done significant amount of logging um, typically quad combo uh, as well as image as, as well as imaging. And one of the logging techniques that was particularly effective when we were drilling um, recent wells, um, including the inclined hole, has been what is called through bit technology. And the reason that we had to use through bit technology was because the temperature exceeds the capability of many of the existing logging tools. And service companies aren't anxious to upgrade their temperature capabilities because they have not yet appreciated that there will be, or should be, or hopefully will be a significant geothermal market. So how these tools work is that you have, uh, you, you run in the hole on tubing and at the bottom of the tubing, you have a bit, but that bit has a hole in the middle of it, okay? And so you, you, you can run in the hole with this bit and the fact that you have the hole in it and ports in that bit and above the bit means that you can circulate chilled fluid. So when you're drilling these wells, you're chilling the fluid because uh, the high temperature will devastate the bits. Um, it, the, 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 the diamond structure will degrade more rapidly with temperature. And um, so if, if you can cool the hole, it helps. And similarly with logging, techniques, you can use conventional logging tools if you can bring the temperature down enough. And so the basis of it, this is to run in the hole and to circulate through that hole in the bit. And then after you've circulated enough and you've cooled the hole down enough, you take the logging tool and you actually pump that logging tool down. It's got a little parachute or device on the end that allows you to pump it down inside the tubing. It is pumped down inside the tubing and it latches um, in the bit here, but it extends outwards in the bit. And so you've pumped your tool in, you've got it connected to your wire line, you make sure it's working, then you disconnect your wire line, pull the wire line out of the hole, and then you come out of the hole with your tubing. You, the, the drill crew pulls the tubing out of the hole progressively. And as you're coming out of the hole, you log the well and the, the logging data are recorded on memory down hole. Fantastic. Uh, least successful uh, for running quad com combo, you know, gamma, porosity, resistivity, um, and um, uh, a digital, digital uh, sonic data recorded. Also, uh, through bit runs with formation microimager, and we have separate runs with uh, ultrasonic borehole imaging devices. So, really, some very 
interesting um, opportunities that are brought to mind because uh, techniques are available to overcome some of the conventional logging difficulties and you don't have to run tools and doers and things like that. And we're gonna look at some of those logs in a minute, but let's sort of put this granite in, in perspective, okay? People at MIT are used to, right from the days of, of Bill Brace, uh, you know, people are used to granite at, at MIT. Not everyone is, and, 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 and people, you know, like to compare, see how it differs from a shale. And what you can see in this plot is that typically it's a higher modulus material. That's no surprise to any of us. In Poisson's ratio, we can't tell too much from that. Typically, the unconfined strength is high. It's nothing like a quartzite necessarily, but it's, 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 it's modest and high. The interesting thing in terms of the measurements that have been done are that the angle of internal friction is particularly high. And so the effect of con confining pressure is going to be substantially felt uh, because of that. You, know, you think of a more failure envelope. This is the slope of the more failure envelope, and it's it's much higher than what we would expect for you know many many sedimentary rocks that we deal with. The other thing that is high is typically it's high, but it's not enormous. Is the mode one fracture toughness? Now. The, the message that comes here because of the strength of this material and, and an elevated fracture toughness is that it is gonna be relatively difficult to break this rock. I haven't shown tensile strengths, but let's presume they're an analog to the, um, the fracture toughness, um, that these are, are tough materials and they're, they're gonna be difficult to break. And indeed we found this from some of our experience in terms of trying to fracture, fracture these reservoirs. And, and, and what you see is probably the fracturing is gonna be dominated by pre-existing in-situ fractures that exist in this formation. And that's gonna be sort of a theme for part of this discussion that we're gonna talk about the roles of natural fractures and how they come to bear in terms of the overall hydraulic fracturing process to connect these two wells. You can also see the matrix permeability is low. Um, now, are there fractures in this formation? Well, let's, let's just look at some of the observations. Uh, this, these are outcrops, they, they outcrop approximately two kilometers away, and this actually is the formation of interest. This is the granite, uh, the granitoid body. Uh, there has been a, a rotation, and, and so, uh, and, and, uh, uh, um, there had, there has been a rotation. I'm not going to necessarily show that. I can't remember whether I show it or not, to be honest, but there has been a rotation um, and uh, the formation is exposed here, but it's at a depth of maybe about three to 4,000 feet um, uh, with alluvium on top of that in the area of interest to, to the west. But what you can see at the surface, and certainly they're exaggerated by erosion is, and, and by uh, stress release, is that there is a network of natural fractures that we would anticipate existing in situ. And indeed, from the FMI data, these are data that were taken uh, from the inclined well. And you can see these data came from through bit logging and, and it really gives a pretty good representation. Certainly larger diameter tools that, that are run in open hole are always preferable, but something that can be run through tubing seems to give good results. And what you can see from these results is, is you can look at the panel on the right and you can see substantial indications of many, many natural fractures that exist along the length, uh, the length of the wellbore. Now, these fractures were determined from a formation microimage imager, a resistivity device. Um, and and you, you basically, for those people that aren't familiar, and I think everyone in, in this seminar is familiar, is that you're mapping resistivity. And here we have the circumference of the well bore unfolded. And this stands, U stands for upper, up, and D stands for down, R stands for right, and L stands for left. Well, we've got those numbers in here because it is not a vertical hole. If it was a vertical hole, you'd be seeing compass azimuths along the top going from zero to 360. But you've basically unfolded the rock and you're characterizing the fractures that are present. We've done a, a similar study with dipole sonic. And you say, well, how do I do that with dipole sonic? Well, what's being done with the dipole sonic and, and uh, um, I, I don't pretend to be the expert here, is that they've evaluated the entire waveform of the dipole sonic. And by virtue of looking at, at some of the uh, lower frequency events, they've been e able to 
uh, look for reflectors that are away from the well bore. And so it's, you know, deep sonic monitoring. And, and Schlumberger is not the first person to have this. I think Baker had it a number of years ago. Uh, but Schlumberger has mapped reflectors that are 30 to 60 feet away from the well bore. And we're attributing those reflectors to being natural fractures of some significance. And you can see from the rose diagram to the upper right that the induced fractures are trending just east of north, shown by the, the, the rose diagram, uh, the, the dots are the poles. Um, and so, so the, the maximum horizontal principal stress is inferred to be a little bit east of north. And so this well was drilled a little bit south of east so that it would allow fractures to be created in a transverse fashion. And so this was a very, very nice addition to the fracture mapping program. It provided to me at least some confidence that at least some of those fractures detected in FMI were fractures of significance. Many of them I personally believe are, are, are small short fractures that are associated with, with thermal relaxation because we had to cool the drilling fluid as we were drilling. In addition, in these wells, a, a significant amount of work was done for in situ stress measurements, trying to do extended leak off tests and diagnostic fracture injection tests. Almost exclusively when we were doing these tests, there was a failure of packer elements, the rubber elements to use to seal the zones. We did have some eventual success even after the packers failed because we had installed um, stout casing in the well and we were able to pump down the casing and actually do diagnostic fracture injection tests at the tip of, at the toe of the inclined well. So that inclined well, it was cased all the way down, cased and cemented all the way down, except for the bottom 200 feet. And so in that bottom 200 feet, we set a packer um, just inside the casing, that packer and, and pump down tubing uh, through the packer and into the open hole zone below. That packer did not hold, but it didn't matter because in this particular case, we were able to continue to pump down tubing and by closing the annular BOPs at the surface and pressurizing the casing as well as the open hole, we were able to fracture the open hole section. And fracturing that open hole section, we, we did a number of tests and, and, and the things that are of interest are um, the, the, the panel on the left shows low rate injection and some determination of in situ stresses from evaluation of the closure. Uh, the middle panel shows breaking this formation down by injecting at five barrels a minute for, oh, I don't know, two and a half minutes short test and then shutting in for 18 hours or so, monitoring the pressure decay, inferring um, the in situ stresses. And the final panel on the right is, is, is interesting to, um, well, at least to people that, that specialize in this area, is that what this involved was a cyclic flow back and shut in. So flow back for 30 seconds, shut in for three minutes, immediately after we stopped pumping. So you can see here that the rate was about five barrels a minute. It's shown in blue in the right-hand panel and five barrels a minute here. The pressure at the surface was just under 3000 PSI. We pumped five barrels a minute. This was the third cycle. This was, the, and in this, in, in the second cycle, we shut in the third cycle, we flowed back, shut in, flowed back, shut in, flowed back, shut in. And by processing that data um, using um, reciprocal uh, um, rate normalized pressures and uh, an e e equivalent, um, a mass balance time, looking for inflections on that, we were also able to infer the, the in situ stresses. Now, the thing that's important about that cyclic injection, cyclic flow back, is that look at this, it was done in about 3000 seconds, whereas at 80,000 seconds in the previous test, we still had not finished, finished the test. So we see some real opportunities for flow back, but that's, uh, I, I talk about that because um, it's something that interests me in particular. Okay, but something that interests the general audience in particular is the reservoir characterization and the success that we had the reason I'm showing this is, is that it, it, it shows the success of the FMI at the left. So you can see at the far left, the static FMI section um, um, in track two, 
well, I guess it's not quite track two, but in, 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 in this panel on, on the left-hand side, you're seeing a dynamic FMI where there's a local over a 10 foot interval or so the colors are enhanced and it it shows more of, of the of the fractures and 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 the structure of the material I have a rose diagram showing the stresses are fundamentally northeast in, in this particular case and what what's interesting to me are the static and dynamic ultrasonic borehole imaging very very beautiful results from this showing um, the static image is unclear. The enhanced image um, is, is the image that's in the second panel uh, from, from the right. And what you can see here is that you can see some sort of drilling induced fractures that are acting just, and this is from a vertical section in a vertical well, just east of north, consistent with something like this, and just west of south, 100 degrees off, but the interesting thing is, is that you start to ask yourself whether these are uh, on echelon fractures or whether this is just a function of some sort of a structure. If it's on echelon fractures, it suggests that this vertical well is not 100% aligned with the, um, it's not necessarily vertical and horizontal, that, that the stress field is not 100% aligned with the well bore. Uh, we have many people that dispute this and, and um, I'm, I'm very interested in alternate opinions as to whether or not this just suggests material anisotropy or some sort of rotation of the stress field. And the rotation of the stress field is not out of the question because in recent times, the overall block of rock has been rotated as well. Nevertheless, the message from this is that there are natural fractures present in, 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 this, in this reservoir. There are drilling induced fractures and we want to consider the consequences of those fractures in terms of designing these three stimulations that I've talked about. Now, how are we going to do those stimulations? Well, pretty much all along, we've been looking at doing um, fluid injection and particularly high rate fluid injection uh, to create hydraulic fracturing. And that's uh, ultimately been the interest, uh, you know, being the technology that has been adopted in many, many, many parts of the, of the world where people have done these measurements. And you can see that um, in these igneous rocks, the bulk of the injections have been hydraulic, and that is at either high rate or low rate. High rate, you're going to favor extensional development and hydraulic fracturing. Low rate, there is the potential for hydraulic shearing and self-propping. And we will do a little bit of low rate injection to try and evaluate um, the potential for hydraulic shearing. You can see that there also has been some acidizing that has been done. We're hesitating to do acidizing because this is dominantly a um, siliceous formation and that the most effective acid in that formation would, would be a mud acid, which is a blend of um, hydrofluoric acid or fluoroboric acid probably um, and, uh, and hydrochloric acid. Um, and it, 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 it's so hot that it just may spend so quickly. We just don't know how acid is really going to perform here without a substantial amount of cool down. Um, acid has been successful elsewhere, in, particularly in hybrid type situations. And then there has been some thermal injection done. The Raft River project that I mentioned really benefited from thermal injection where the cool down was associated with a reduction in the total principal stresses and ultimately some sort of fracture evolution that was associated with it. Um, so if somebody's interested in thermal stimulation, the publications on Raft River are a good example. The only caveat there is that we got Raft River to be successful, but that was after injecting several billion gallons of cold fluid into um, 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 uh, uh, an, an injection well. We were originally given that injection well because it wouldn't take fluid. And the fact that uh, thermal stimulation was a success was reflected by the fact that the organization ultimately wanted the well back. So how are we gonna treat this? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna do hydraulic fracturing. That is, that is the ultimate decision in this particular well. And uh, we can ask, well, how is hydraulic fracturing or hy hydraulic injection at least worked in other scenarios? Well, in, in the Fenton Hill scenario, we showed you the, the, the diagram earlier that, that there, there was an abundance of, of microseismic ac activity for a, a large um, injection that was done in December 1983. But uh, there, there, there was 
limited interconnection between the two wells and the, the, the directionality of, of the growth of, of, of the cloud, whether it was biased by, by measurements or whatever, seemed to be away from the, the production, the, the recipient well. And so, so, so there are challenges in terms of, you know, fractures going where you want them to go. At Rosemanawi's um, in, in Cornwell, that was also reflected because there were some indications that the fractures grew downwards when injection was carried out there. The geomechanical calculations done for, for the forge situation suggest that there will be upward growth. Salts, you can see the patterns there in some of these wells and they show, you know, you know, well, there is, there is a cloud, they're showing that there is some network of hydraulic communication that that is 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 trending at least vertically in in ellipsoidal pattern uh basel very interesting okay basel was a situation where um high rate hydraulic fracturing uh was was implemented it was ultimately terminated because of of seismic activity um but the the micro seismicity is is really quite quite interesting in terms of what you see in 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 this particular situation and what you can see in this particular situation is it looks like there has been uh, um, growth along some sort of pre-existing feature and the growth has been reflected in terms of some wing cracks. And so there were shear initially because of a slightly, uh, a fracture that was slightly offset from the inferred maximum principal stress and beautiful, beautiful wing cracks resulted. I mean, this is just a classic mechanics example of the growth of these wing cracks that grow and shear, but ultimately align with the maximum principal stress. Um, re regrettably, the seismicity uh, precluded this becoming a commercial site. So one has to ask, well, what about these natural fractures and how are they going to contribute if one is stimulating these wells? Well, we've seen a lot of evidence, geological evidence, uh, logging evidence, uh, and um, outcrops, whatever, that suggested there are not natural fractures. And one wonders how those are gonna impact the ultimate stimulation that is going on. And so here are some, some thoughts by various people, even well before Forge, in terms of trying to understand what sort of mechanisms will occur. Well, I, I'd be disingenuous if I said I knew exactly what was going on, although my predisposition is that the rock is strong enough that the fractures are going to be are finding natural fractures and reactivating and reopening those natural fractures. And I'm thinking it's going to be something like these two scenarios here uh, on, on the right-hand panel, the two scenarios at the extreme right, where you're going to have a combination between hydraulic fractures and, and uh, uh, following natural fractures, ultimately propagating um, in a plane, in a nominal plane perpendicular to the minimum principal stress. Now, where we run into issues these days is, is that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of evidence from some beautiful, beautiful pilot studies in, in the oil industry where natural fractures seem to be ignored in those particular cases. And so you have to ask, you know, what are the scenarios um, and, and why would FORGE be different? Well, the scenarios could be that, that the stress contrast um, in, in these formations may be such that um, uh, linearly or, or planar oriented features are, are, are appropriate. I mean, these, these pilots are, are very, very strong information where there's been a lot of wells drilled, a lot of micro seismic monitoring and, and, and very, very um, um, significant evidence of, of planar features and, and including fiber optics in, in, offset, in offset wells. And so th there's a lot of feeling now um, by people in the oil and gas industry that natural fractures don't matter. And the question that we have in, in the geothermal side is that, is, is that true here or do those natural fractures actually, is, is this an extreme, is this an extrema where natural fractures in the geothermal business are going to be much more, much more important because it's more difficult to create uh, virgin fractures in, in, in the rock. Now, even within the, the oil field, there are some observations that secondary fracturing was, was, was observed um, as, as shown in this publication by Halliburton evaluating some of these things, but um, work by Julia Gale at, 
the Bureau of Economic Geology in Texas has, has also shown, well, natural fracks are present. Some of them were activated, but uh, not all of them. And the ones that were activated um, were in a favorably oriented direction. So just sort of as we might anticipate. So this ultimately brings us to the question is that, you know, we have this complex reservoir and what are the challenges that we're dealing with in this reservoir? We're dealing with potentially natural fracturing. We're dealing with a situation that is a uh, um, high modulus, high strength formation. And we're dealing with a situation where there's a high temperature. So how would one go about doing this? Well, let's look back at history and see if we're gonna to propose to do anything substantially different. This picture I took in December, 1983, um, during the stimulation of that Fenton Hill Reservoir. And, and what did we pump? We pumped slick water. That's just what we're pumping these days. We pumped it at 50 barrels a minute. That's you know a high rate. And we pumped almost 6 million gallons of fluid with uh, 200 mesh calcium carbonate as a fluid loss or, di or diversion added. This is almost identical to what we will conceive of these days. So believe it or not, hydraulic fracturing technology has not changed substantially. Uh, the ability to treat horizontal wells and isolate those horizontal wells has, and has, has changed significantly, but the treatments have not changed substantially. And so we have some questions to ask about the fluids that will pump, um, whether, we'll, whether we'll try and do hydraulic shearing, what the role is for natural fractures. And those are all major questions. And still on top of this, what we have to deal with are cementing uh, technology. And, and I'll show a slide on that. That is relevant. Isolation technology, how can we get these packers to actually work at high enough temperatures? What sort of stimulation we're gonna, and what sort of stimulation we're, we're gonna use? Well, you say, well, why is the cementing important? Well, the cementing is kind of important because um, we're worried, first of all, if there are vacancies in the cement, that once we start to apply high pressure to the casing, whether that casing is gonna bulge or fail in those vacancies or if uh, that casing is at risk because of microseismic uh, growth along pre-existing fracture systems. We're also worried about the movement of that case. There's gonna be a poor bond between the cement and the pipe. And think about what happens when I pump 4,000 barrels of cold fluid down this casing. That casing is gonna shrink and it's gonna shrink a substantial amount so actually one of the things we're considering is whether or not we have to heat the fluid that we're pumping in the hole. We'll never be able to get it up high enough, but just some degree of heating may actually be relevant to prevent that casing from, uh, from moving as much as, as, as we might anticipate it would. And if you do the calculations for how much that casing is gonna move, you'll be surprised. It's, it's not inches, it's, it's if nothing, if, 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 if there's very poor bond and, you decrease the temperature by hundreds of degrees, that uh, in contraction can be in, on the order of 20 feet. Significant movement is possible. Also the isolation technology. So, so you, you, you have different stages in these fractures and you isolate a previous stage from the current stage by putting in elements called packers, which have rubber elements that are expanded against the wall of the casing and seal off the downstream of where you're currently pumping. We've had a history of failure of these uh, because of, of temperature uh, that the, the rubber hasn't tolerated temperature and also probably because of changes in dimensions of the tubing because of thermal effects. And, and so, uh, we are looking at situations now where we where we don't have the the tubing attached that those things aren't are the, the temperature isn't as big of an issue uh, in terms of uh, the change stress field and also looking at different elastomers um, on, on these polymers to tolerate 400 odd degrees Fahrenheit and and the pressures won't exceed 8,000 because our wellhead is only rated for 10,000 but psi but but it's a it's a big it's a big deal. And so for our stimulation, we'll be looking at, um, at uh, high temperature and uncertain fracture morphology. So what are we gonna do? What, what, are, what are we gonna do? And I'll, I'll wrap this up pretty quickly. I, um, uh, we're gonna pump three stages at the toe, okay? 
The first stage will be in this open hole section, and that will be using slick water. And slick water is a, is just water, and it's 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 slick, meaning it's got friction reducer added. And that what that does is that reduces the frictional losses as you pump this fluid. And we're going to pump it at a high rate, ideally up to 50 barrels a minute. It will have a um, organic tracer in it. I mean, tagged with an organic tracer, a separate organic tracer in a second stage. But in the second stage, it's not open hole. It's in a cased and perforated section that, as I mentioned, is isolated from stage one by one of these uh, frack plugs, the rubber element that's expanded against the wall to isolate the previous zone. So you install the frack plug, uh, you perforate the well, and then you pump your treatment. And, and this would be um, uh, friction reduced water um, with a different organic tracer. The final zone would be about another couple hundred feet up hole, and that would be using a cross-link, much higher viscosity fluid. And that would be tagged with a discrete tracer and also with, with a man-made propent. But this propent is a very, very fine mesh micropropent that probably isn't going to impact the viscosity of the fluid what, whatsoever. And so what we're aspiring to do is to grow a vertical fracture from the blue well to up where the red well will ultimately intersect that. And we want that distance to be at least 300 feet uh, so that when we drill it, um, we'll be able to connect to it. And, and we're going to drill into the microseismic cloud and hopefully inter, inter, interconnect. Um, if we don't interconnect, we'll have to do some remedial treatments. Uh, so we'll be, uh, as we're pumping these treatments, we'll be monitoring the, we'll be monitoring the treat, the micro seismicity and hopefully using the micro seismicity to guide us as to whether or not we need to pump more than we plan or potentially less than we plan. And we want these fractures to grow up, but not necessarily, uh, laterally, um, uh, either along the length of the fracture or perpendicular to the length of the fracture. And as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll have guide the treatments with our micro seismicity. So we're gonna start this first stage and we're gonna pump it at about five barrels a minute. We're gonna pump slick water and, and we're gonna pump slick water because that's what the service pumping companies are used to pumping, okay? We're not gonna pump propent because we don't wanna have the risk of that pump of that propent screening out, meaning that the propent jams into the fracture and prevents propagation of the fracture from occurring. We're going to start at five barrels a minute. We already know that we can treat this open hole zone at five barrels a minute because I showed you a diagnostic fracture injection test earlier and we'll pump at five barrels a minute. So we'll pump at five barrels a minute and then we will increment our treating rate um, in five barrel per minute increments. And I, I could say that we did this because of a sophisticated design, but we're doing this just uh, out of caution because we really don't know what's going to happen, how the, how the reservoir is going to respond. And so we're going in relatively small increments and we're, we're seeing how the friction develops, how the, how, how the treating pressure develops, and leaving it long enough to get a significant um, stabilized microseismic cloud. Once we walk this up to 50 barrels a minute, as you can see on this plot, rate on the left, uh, total volume on the right. We'll walk it up to here. We'll leave it at 50 barrels a minute, and then we'll re reduce the rate um, progressively. And when we reduce this rate progressively, um, it's, it's what's called a step-down test, and this will tell us something about the friction in the near wellbore domain. Uh, all along, we'll be mo monitoring microseismicity. We have a traffic light system in place, and if seismic activity, microseismic activity exceeds certain criteria, uh, then, then we'll, we'll, we'll take actions that range from reducing the pumping rate to actually going home. Um, and hopefully the latter does not, does not occur. Uh, we've done a lot of monitoring or modeling in, in, in terms of this. You know, the, the, the complication with the, mon with the monitoring is, is, uh, is the unstable that was an alarm telling me to stop, <laughs> um, uh, is the uncertainty in these parameters. And, and you can see that we have uncertainty in the strength, the fracture toughness, the, the modulus, some degree of uncertainty, certainly an uncertainty in the fluid loss that's incurred because of, of, of the um, uh, um, natural fractures and the variation in the in-situ stresses. 
And the variation in the in-situ stresses is reflected in these simple simulations that we've done here with some planar fracture models that you can see depth here and you can see the stress gradient during here where the there's a low stress zone predicted by the Schlumberger stress predictions, some variations in moduli. And if you do some simulations with a simple planar mod model, what you can see is that this fracture is captured by this particular reduction in the in situ stresses. Nothing that's really surprising to anybody familiar with this. Whereas if you assume just a constant stress gradient as we have in other models, you can see that the fracture height becomes 400 feet here. Whereas in this pre previous situation where I showed you here, it's much lower, it's just a couple hundred feet because it's captured here. And so these simulations have shown us that reservoir characterization is really, really Im important. Unfortunately, we don't really know what's, what's gonna happen. And, and despite all of the simulations that we've done, including a large body of simulations using discrete fracture network modeling, use, using Itasca's Excite code, um, we'll just have to wait and see in, in terms of what the fractures and the micro seismicity show us. Itasca has done some sophisticated three-dimensional modeling, building in the DFNs. And you can see from the, 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 the plot on, on the left, this is a simulation of stage one, that we see a significant upwards growth. We pumped a lot of fluid and it's permeable. And the reason I say permeable is because you have flow into the natural fractures that were specified in this model, that there was a frictional DFN. If, as in the second part model, you say that those natural fractures were impermeable and had a high friction coefficient, you get something that's much, much more like what one anticipate for a conventional planar hydraulic fracture. And indeed, no DFN. It's just a, a, a planar model like what I described before. And so from this plot of those, we can see that the height we're going to get depending on what we select, it's a minimum of 100 meters and maybe substantially higher. And based on that, that meets our 300 foot criteria. So I'm feeling good about what the simulations tell me. Um, I also look at the, um, the height at which slip occurs and, and we're seeing significant slippage upwards. And um, so even if I am not opening fractures extensionally, I've got reactivated fractures that are communicating vertically. Now, the only drawback with those reactivating fractures is the lateral extent. That means how far up and down the length of the wellbore we're extending. And we wanna minimize that extent because we do not want these stages interacting with each other. And you can see that depending on what happens, it could be significant in terms of, of, of these meters. And so this is, this is probably one of our biggest worries. And, it will be taken into account on the fly. That means while we are there doing these treatments to decide where we perforate from one zone to another. So my final slide is that from the hydraulic fracturing, we're initially just looking at connectivity, being able to connect between one well to the other. You know, ultimately in this project, project we're looking at connectivity, conductivity, conformance, conversion. But today I'm only talking about connectivity and we were able to compare different treatments look at the role of natural fractures. We'll wait on conductivity and propin for the future. And we may have to do some remedial injection. We'll just have to wait and see remedial to be sure that we've connected between the two wells. So a fantastic opportunity here and really something that can advance the state of geothermal science. And so, and so I, I apologize for going on long. Um, I, um, uh, uh, but I'd be open to answer any questions for those people that can stay. Thanks, John, for the great talk. It's very informative. Um, we are now open up for questions. I see there are a few questions from uh, Emma in chat, in Zoom chat. Thank you, John. Yeah, maybe if you can, I, I can't see the chat. So if you could read the questions. It or, or maybe Emma might want to. Sure, I can do that. <laughs> I was just taking notes and putting questions in. Um, let me ask my last question first. So basically, um, you said that people had found in the oil and gas industry primarily that natural fractures don't matter. And so I'm, I'm trying to reconcile that with mechanical intuition, because if, if, if you asked me to choose between, you know, two specimens of rock to, to frack, I would 
why wouldn't I always choose the one that already has cracks in it? So what would be the reason I wouldn't want a one that's already cracked? So I'm going to try to crack it more. You know, it's just like the fashion industry. It changes every year. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if we looked, if we looked five to 10 years ago, there, there was a, a huge influx of publications where people were doing, you know, based on some of the work by Pollard and his colleagues, you know, fantastic work, where people were looking at the role of natural fractures in terms of um, impeding hydraulic fractures and, and whatever. Now, what has happened is that we've had specific reservoirs where the natural fractures are less important, okay? And, and, and so I think one has to take this with, within a, just exactly as you said, it's a combination of our geomechanics into intuition and really looking at what the characteristics of those specific reservoirs are. But the problem is, is that these studies have been so widely publicized that sometimes, sometimes it, it's taken as, um, uh, as the norm. So this is a situation where I believe that the contrast in, in the principal stresses favors um, um, fractured, controlled fracture growth in a nominally planar situation. And that the characteristics of the natural fractures may be such that they do not substantially impede uh, deviations of these fractures. Also in those situations, if you look carefully at them, there, there are publications that suggest that the secondary fractures are indeed sometimes activated. So you, you have to be, I mean, this is just, just like everything that we do these days, we have to parse it carefully and sort out what we really is gonna believe is specific for our specific reservoirs. Exactly as you say, we believe in this particular reservoir that because of the relatively high value of the fractured toughness, the inferred elevated elevation of the tensile, tensile strength and the presence of certainly some natural fractures, that the natural fractures are gonna play a role. We've done previous stimulations where we selected zones to perforate and complete, where some of those zones had an abundance of natural fractures and some of them had a paucity of natural fractures. We were able to break down the zone that had the abundance and we could not break down the zone because of wellhead restrictions uh, that had fewer fractures. So this is one of the things we definitely want to establish and um, our intellectual preference is that the natural fractures will play a role in this formation. And we need to establish the magnitude of that role by the measurements that we're making in this reservoir. So, so our, our opinions are aligned, but I don't necessarily agree with everybody. Uh, it sounds complicated, but that was a great answer. Thank you. What, what does the stress field tell you about the, whether the natural fractures should split. Do you feel you know the minimum stress and the maximum stress amplitude well enough to infer whether fractures are favorably oriented? Well, you, 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 uh, that's a loaded question. And, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, and probably a rhetorical question, but I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best to answer it. Okay. So uh, we got a pretty good idea of the vertical stress. <laughs> Just oh, based, yeah. well, based on assumptions, <laughs> measurements of density. Okay. Yeah. Um, the minimum principal stress. When when we first started to measure the minimum principal stress, we were pump pumping small volume um, microfracs, and we were measuring uh, relatively small values of, of of the minimum principal stress, like 0.62 psi per foot, and that's you know that's 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 common, but it's on the, on the lower end. As we started to pump larger injection treatments, defits, and, and techniques to infer the minimum principal stress, we found that um, we, we modified our inference of the minimum principal stress up to about 0.75 PSI per foot. And so my attribution is that, that those lower principal stresses were reflecting near wellbore fractures that had developed because of, of, of thermal cool down as we were drilling the well. So We've, we've migrated towards a number that we feel more confident for the minimum principal stress. The maximum, um, originally we didn't have any breakouts in these rocks, <clears throat> that the, the rock was strong enough that we didn't have breakouts. So we, we had a difficult time making any sort of inference in, in, in the, the maximum principal stress, uh, horizontal stress. Uh, a, as we drilled these wells, we, we, we did get breakouts, but our conventional calculations of the maximum principal stress using these breakouts are giving us values of uh, maximum horizontal principal stress that we 
that are, are quite large and, and we're uncertain as to whether or not they're realistic. So we're still presuming that we're in a normal stress environment that the maximum horizontal principal stress and extensional environment, that the, the maximum principal stress is somewhere between the, the, um, uh, the vertical and, and the minimum, that we're not in a shearing uh, regime. And so we have good comfort with the minimum. I, I would have to say now we have pretty good comfort with the minimum, with the, uh, um, the vertical principal stress. But a, as usual, the maximum principal stress is something that um, has been a variable in terms of the numerical calculations that we're carrying out. And it, it, by virtue of, of that, it can vary anywhere between the minimum and, and, and the vertical. And, and that, that comes into play in these calculations in terms of governing the extent of the shearing that, that occurs. We still see hydraulic fracturing, but the amount of, of hydraulic shearing is governed by the magnitude that we select for the maximum. So, um, despite our best efforts, we're still somewhat uncertain about the maximum in maximum horizontal principal stress. Do you think the pre-existing fractures are vertical? I mean, I'm, I wonder, are they tilted um, the, to the those, vertical? So, I'm no, sorry. No, you're, 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 by and large, those fractures are inclined um, somewhat, and, and, and we see some shallow. But most of them are maybe at um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, a dip of 65 degrees or something like that, that they're 60, 25 degrees from the vertical. So there, there are inclined fractures that are present. And so it's th this is why uh, where we see this the microseismic cloud growing is going to be really, really instructive in terms of understanding what is going on in this formation. There, there was some seismicity observed, I think, during the earlier the small stimulations. Do they provide any any help in, in understanding yeah. or? Yeah. So so you know the this was this was done in 2019. There there were there were three zones that, that were stimulated in an existing vertical well, and we had geophones in a well that was uh, um, about 3,000 feet deep, and the geophones straddled the granitic contact. There were 12 geophones spaced out 100 feet apart. Now, this well was relatively close to the vertical well that was stimulated, and these geophones were um, at a much, much shallower um, shallower depth. They were at 3,000 feet, and we were treating at maybe 6,000 feet. So we did, in fact, measure um, microseismicity in the minus 2 to minus 1 range. Uh, however, Schlumberger did not feel comfortable in the location because of, of the bias and the location of, of the geophones that it was almost looking right down on, on where the events were occurring. So we're certain that we can create events, um, and, and, but we were not comfortable that we could um, accurately locate those events at that time. And so the, the upcoming stimulation where we have three wells ideally located, straddling the toe of this well, and geophones as deep as we can get them based on temperature restrictions, and that's about 220, 200, 220 degrees C. And so those, those will be maybe at 7,000 feet depth or something like that. Um, we feel much more comfortable that we, we should be able to see uh, and triangulate on, on events reliably. So the question was accurate that that there were uh, events that were detected. Uh, the events were in a magnitude range that we were anticipating, but we could not, in good conscience, locate those events. Um, I'd, I'd like to to jump in because I have to step out, and there's one thing I'd like to be able to achieve uh, before doing so, and I'll have to hold my questions. What I want to do is mention that we have in the room uh, a student in Herbert Einstein's group. His name is Perry Smalls, and he's also um, a, a founder of a startup on electrical stimulation. Cool. And um, he, was, he was wondering if um, it would make sense to be in touch with you guys on the topic of electrical stimulation in concert with, with hydrofracking um, they're, they're, they're moving in that area, interested in collaborations with the DOE. And uh, um, so I guess the broad 
theme here is, you know, is, is Forge open to, you know, crazy ideas about stimulation? Uh, uh, well, I can't say about Forge, but I'm always interested in crazy <laughs> ideas. Uh, and, and it's not crazy. Okay. Uh, but, uh, uh, was it Robert? Paris? Where is Paris? Is Paris uh, here? Yeah. Oh, Paris. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we would. Uh, I, I would be happy to interact uh, and 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 facilitate some sort of presentation um, so that you can introduce various people to this to this concept. Yeah, and I I, I can um I guess since I have the floor, I'll, I'll do a quick. I have to step review. out. So th okay. thank you so much, John. I really appreciate this. Uh, uh, we we I, I think you, you'll get more questions from from the audience. So you know, thanks again. Well, thanks, Laurent, and, and I'm sorry I went on so long. Oh, no, no, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so just real quick, I can uh, actually I can't do that. My uh, okay, sorry. My, but I also want to make sure that people get to ask their questions to John about his stuff, right? So um, let's make okay. sure we, we get those in through. Yep. Right. I'll be quick. But since you, I just submitted a um a proposal to RPE, um. And it, the reviews are pretty good. Looking at maybe getting it funded if it gets funded for five to six weeks. And I've also been in contact with been in contact with the Switzerland, similar to Forge, but much lower, um, uh, much shallower. Uh, Batterito is in uh, is another yep. like underground lab, yep. and they're interested yep. in testing there as well. Um, yep. So essentially, what we're looking to do is instead of doing high pressure hydraulic fracturing, we use uh, the dual heating process to create make the fractures really hot. Follow it up with um, with cold water injection, temperature differentials create fractures, and also do post uh, electric fracking between the two um, electrodes. Um, it's pretty early stage, but we've got some uh, initial stuff in the lab that I've been working on and looking to do some field trials here. And we wrote up a lot of stuff about what we want to do with Forge in the proposal. We could talk about it later. It would be very, very. I'd be very interested in in uh, exploring this further with you and Professor Einstein. Okay, I'll set up a a call maybe sometime next few weeks. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, I, well, and I and I can set up from this end so that you can have you, you know the correct people participating. Okay, thank you. Hey, thanks. Uh, I did see one question. Let's see. Um, so it was it it it, it was a, a dipole sonic. Um, I'm, I'm I I I don't believe that there was much uh, differentiation between the. Uh, 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 fast and slow uh, shear waves, and and so I'm not sure how much anisotropy was actually detected. I'm 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 a little embarrassed to say that I should know an answer to your uh, I should know an answer to your question. I I think that the um, anisotropy was actually quite minimal. But uh, Douglas, I, I I can try and find out an answer to that question for you. I asked the question. I uh, just. Curious in general, uh, 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 dipole sonic uh, analyzation for anisotropy in a highly deviated well is tricky. And if you have local induced fra fractures and you have stress fields that are rotated away from the plane normal to the borehole, uh, somebody at Schlumberger knows how to think about all that stuff. And, and um... In, indeed, they they parsed this data pretty pretty significantly, um, but I don't have a specific answer to your question, and I'll try and find out. Yeah, very interesting talk. Thank you. So, if there's no more questions from Zoom, should we have any question from the classroom? George, could you help to unmute? I, oh, I, I can answer the first question. That the, the, the reason um, uh, why were FMI data not interpretable on on twelve twenty seven, and and that was nothing to do with analysis. That was that was due to the fact that the uh, the, the data set had been corrupted, uh, likely due to uh, a component failure because of temperature. Thank you. And um, second question was. When you talked about thermal stimulation, how do you get the heat in? Is it using some kind of uh, electricity or what? Um, 
the, the thermal st stimulation that, that, that has, has been conventionally done in these reservoirs is cold water injection or just, uh, and, and so, so it's, it's not heating the formation up, it's, it's cooling the formation. Oh, I see. And, and so, so what happens when you cool the formation, as you can imagine, is, is that you cool, you cool the reservoir and there's a thermoelastic uh, coupling between the temperature in the, pore, in the fluid and the fractures and, and the response of the cooling formation. And there tends to be a reduction in the in the total stresses. So, with that reduction in the total stresses, you 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 have a reduction in the normal stress on that fracture, and that has that accomplishes one of two things. It it either causes uh, uh, well it causes increase in aperture for one thing, so that you know hydraulic transport is improved, but the reduction in the normal stress can also impact. The, uh, the frictional resistance, and you can also see shearing events happening. And, and actually, as, as we did it in Raft River, and, you know, we inject a lot of fluid there. And, and over days and weeks and months, we could watch seismicity walk along um, um, a, a, a mapped uh, fracture system. So, it's it just actual, a so, so the, the, the rock matrix is compressing because it's being chilled. Is that right? It's it, it well the, the the matrix is yes that's correct it's it's shrinking because it's being chilled yes. Thank you. Does that does that uh, walking effect follow a diffusion front that you understand? It. it, it <laughs> <laughs> or have a story. I, I think about, if, if I you have a that story in, about the rate at which that walking thing walks. You know, it it, it follows uh, a mapped fault system, and uh, you know the good thing was is that 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 the uh, that the seismicity was sub zero. Um, you know whether we completely understand it or not. I mean that's that's why I smiled. Uh, but it it looked like it it followed a definitely a major mapped fault system that bounded the geothermal field. And so intellectually it it made sense. And presumably convective change of temperature. That is that is absolutely correct. Again, very interesting talk. <laughs> well, thank you. So, if, we have, are, are there uh, any do students? Do we have any other questions? I guess there's no question from the classroom. Yeah. Okay. So, thanks again, John. Wonderful talk. In the thanks all for attending today's wish. Uh, next Wednesday, we will have Yin Huabian from um, Exxon, who will give a talk in person. So the food will be available after the talk. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks very much.